Uh, hello everyone, this is Rajiv S. Khanna from the Law Offices of Rajiv S. Khanna PC, immigration.com. I'm starting a minute early just to take the time to show you that we have various um, services. We have a YouTube channel. If you go to immigration.com, on the very top panel, uh, you see link to our YouTube channel, uh, hundreds of videos. Uh, Twitter, I'm very, very active on Twitter. Uh, you can see the tweet feed on the right hand side on immigration.com. Uh, Google Plus, LinkedIn, Facebook, connect with me please, Pinterest. And then we have an app for iPhone and an app for Android. There are free apps and we think we've done a good job. So, you know, try these services out. And as always, if you have any questions, concerns, or comments on how to make things better, let us know. That said, it is now 12.30. Let's get started on the call. Uh, beginning with the first question from Rajesh Mahaji. This is a frequently asked question. What do I do if there is a change in my job title or duties during the green card process? So with Raj, what has happened is he's got I-140 approved with the title Business Systems Analyst. He got promoted to director. Okay. And his lawyer says it's okay to have some career progression. More than 50% of job duties are same as old job. You see, I think you, you had stated this on our website also, and I told you that that's a little optimistic. Be careful, because there is absolutely no guarantee under today's laws that if your duties change, you don't have to start the green card process all over again. Now, President Obama has said in his executive order that they'll make it clear um, through a memorandum or maybe a regulation, we don't know for sure. I think it should be through a memorandum that the definition of same or similar job for green card purposes would include those um, jobs where they are related or the job is a natural progression in a person's career. My problem is that is okay in the context of AC21, but you are not at the AC21 stage. Okay, you are really before that stage. Now, of course, if uh, Obama's proposals pass and um, his executive order goes all the way, um, things might be different. But as of today, a person in your situation is better off starting the second green card for the higher job and then transferring the priority date. Why take a chance? It's a few thousand dollars. It is well worth it. Uh, I would not take it, take it, take a chance with that. So if I were your lawyer, I would have said, look, I think you should start a second green card process just to be safe. Okay. Now, since I have marked this question as a frequently asked question, I want to invite any discussion on this topic right now. So we keep it all together. Okay. Anybody has any question or comment about this change in job titles or duties during the green card process, press star five on your phone. No new questions, only on this topic, star five. If you press star five on your phone, I can see you and I'll unmute you so we can talk. Okay, no question. Let's go on to the next topic. Aditya Siddhai says, I have an approved H-1B petition. It's not stamped yet. It was filed through an employer in Ohio, but I'm presently working in India. So you are not in USA. You've got the H-1 approval, no visa stamping, but you're working uh, in India. Wife is in US on H-1B visa. Can I get my H4 stamp in India, come to the US, then after a few days apply for a change of status for H1B? Um, it's an interesting situation. I think you can, but there are a couple of issues. First, are you no longer subject to the H1 quota? Now, if you ask USCIS, they will say, until you get the H1 stamping done, you are still subject to the quota. But your petition has not been revoked. so. I think that problem is taken care of. So when you come to USA and you apply for H1 uh, change of status, I think you should be fine. You should not be subject to the court. Second problem is if I come on a non-work visa like H4, and then within 30, 40, 50 days apply for a work visa change of status, is that permissible? I would say probably not. I would just want to not take a chance and wait a few months, maybe three months, two months or three months before I apply for change of status. Okay. 
Raj USA has a question. Raju says, I have a three-year bachelor's degree in computer science, two years master's degree in, U in computer science from UK. Educational evaluation is equivalent to a US master's degree from three reputed evaluators. First of all, Aditya, uh, Raju, I don't care how reputed the uh, evaluators are. I want the degrees to be evaluated under ACRAO EDGE standards. ACRAO, A-A-C-R-A-O, dash EDGE. EDGE is a database maintained by American Association of uh, Collegiate Registrars and Admissions Officers, uh, ACRAO. Okay, so get that evaluated. If it then indeed comes out to be equivalent to a US master's degree, you should cover both things. If you are also covered by bachelor's plus five, you should cover both things. Okay, can I apply perm under EB2 with master's with one year's experience? You can actually do that, sure. Or, or EB2 with bachelor's plus five, you can do that as well. Okay, uh, but usual formula for EB2 is master's plus three or bachelor's plus five. Okay. Uh, you can go with only masters, but if you're going to go with both, then it's usually MS plus three or bachelor's plus five. My perm status is pending in Balka. Can I apply one more perm with the same employer for a different position? Theoretically, yes. But the problem is when it is the same employer, same employee, and you file a second case, they will deny the second case. Then you'll have to file a motion to reopen explaining that the two jobs are different. I think it, it, you'll lose some time in that. So. Just be careful with that. And normally, I don't advise doing that. Next question, SMP. Wife has an H-1B visa. It's good till October 2014. She's looking for a client. Well, it's since October 2014. She's looking for a client right now. We are going to India for a family emergency, but she can't go for H-1B stamping because she doesn't have a client. She has an H-4 visa. Can she come back to USA on H-4? Yes, she can. Do we have, have to apply for change of status? Yes, you do. If she comes back to US on H4, then her status will change automatically from H1 to H4? Correct. Uh, what is the time required to change the status from H4 to H1? Can we do change of status in premium filing? You can. Can she start working uh, once the change of status is filed? No, she can. There's one more problem I see here. Guys, a lot of people don't know this. But there's a law in the books that says if you have been out of status in the US even for one day, your visa is considered to be canceled. Because this is not a problem that is visible, a lot of people don't realize it. Even government has no way of tracking if you are out of status. But if they do figure that out, that your wife was on H1 and she went out of status because she doesn't have a job, then the H4 visa can consider to be canceled. It's a very, very uh, thorny and um, odd problem. So be careful with this issue. Other than that, what you're planning is fine. Okay. Um, what you can also do is explain the situation to the consulate in an email and ask them, do they want her to come in for another H4 visa stamp? If they say no, you are fine. If they say yes, then I think you don't have a choice but to go for H4 stamping when she's in it. Next question is uh, Nishikan, approved I-140 from previous employer. The new employer is applying for PERM. Do you think the new reform will benefit my situation? Well, if President Obama says, um, I don't think he can do that, but if he says you can somehow use that I-140 to file 485 with another employer, I guess you could use that. Or you could also use the situation if they allow you to file 485 right away without waiting for priority date to be current, and your previous employer has the intention to uh, have you join them upon approval of the green card, they can issue you an offer letter. You could, while you're working with the present employer, file 485. After 180 days, you actually don't have to join the old employer as long as the jobs are same or similar. So in two ways, you could be benefited. One, if Obama does something and it allows your I-140 to be somehow used for the prior for the present employer, or if they implement the filing of the 485 without waiting for the priority date to be current. Both cases you could be benefiting. Krishna New, Palm is filed December 2013 through a top Indian consulting company. 
H1 is out 2015. Firm is still going on. No audit. Apply for H1 extension for 365-day rule, waiting for seventh-year extension. I want to change my jobs. Will my H1 go void? Uh, void once my H1 transfer is completed with the new company, but the old company withdraws my firm, and the answer is no. Right now, there is no provision under the regulations for USCIS to void a case that they have already approved. So you're working with this employer. You've got your extension through this employer. You do your transfer to another employer. Don't change companies until you get the transfer approved. Once the transfer is approved, um, I don't think the government can legally um, revoke your H-1. They certainly don't have a policy of doing it. We have plenty of people in this situation. Their policy is not to take back what they've already given. Um, theoretically, there is a regulation that says they can revoke any case for whatever reason, if the reason develops. But you know, the way I look at it, on the date your H-1 transfer for one year is approved, you had a valid ground for it. There is no law that says you must continue to have that ground all the way till the end of the H-1 approval. So even if the old employer revokes the firm, you should be able to keep your H-1. I don't see any problem with it. Um, is there any way my old company cannot withdraw your firm? They don't have to. They don't have to. There is no law that, that says that they have to withdraw the firm. Is there any way we can prevent? No. You cannot make the company go forward with the firm. What is the fees associated with the with it with uh, with it to withdraw a perm? There is no fees in withdrawing a perm. Zero fees. How will I know whether my old company has withdrawn my perm? I don't think you can because this is technically not considered to be your case unless you are you have access to your own lawyers who are representing the company and you both. You can insist that your employer your lawyer inform you when the case is withdrawn. Other than that, I don't see how you can come to know. At least I don't know. Next question is Zap Zero Zap wants to know November 20th conference call. I confused you and probably others with my incomplete question. No problem. Let's see if we can get it right now. So you became an LPR. This is the history on June 2009. Then you left three months later for nine months of absence. Then you came back after nine months and you were here for seven months and then again you were gone for 11 months. During my second absence, I continued to pay rent half of the duration until my lease ended and I also got admitted to master's program during my second absence, which I started immediately after my third visit. I had not applied for re-entry permit and not filed taxes because I had not worked. So I have a copy of my lease agreement and admission to master's program, also bank account. Uh, okay, so can I apply for naturalization? Well, it's a little difficult for me to predict how the government is going to take it. Look, if you are gone in any 12 month period for more than six months, less than one year, you have to be able to explain what the reason for the absence was. Heaven forbid, was there an illness in the family? Were you setting up a business? What is the reason you were gone so long? And they are very concerned when you have protracted absences because if you abandon your green card, instead of getting citizenship, you could end up losing your green card. It's a fairly tricky situation. So. I, I, I would be very reluctant to advise you that this is an open and shut easy case. I would strongly advise you um, get yourself a lawyer in the state where you want to file for naturalization. Okay, We can represent people in all uh, proceedings, but since we will not be able to go with you for the interview, you feel like getting a local lawyer, do so. Get in touch with them, make sure they are competent, make sure they understand the situation and see what they advise you, okay? My advice would be to come back, establish your green card for sure, get yourself a job here, start working, and then one, two years down the line, then apply so that there's no question about your intention to stay in the USA. 
Next question is Sai. Holding H1B, I haven't traveled to USA. Employer has a project from a client which is of two, three months. So the question is, um, can my salary be paid in India? No, not for H1. And per diem is not considered to be salary. Okay, so in my view, if you are coming on coming in on H1, you have to be paid in USA, and you have to be paid a regular salary like any US employee, and your taxes have to be deducted. Per diem, there's no taxation. Okay, so absolutely incorrect as far as I know. There are exceptions for people on L1 visa, but not H1. If you are on H1, you have to be paid in USA. Okay. I don't know about tax laws. I only know about immigration laws. In my view, immigration laws will not permit you to be paid outside USA. Oh, by the way, if you were on coming on a B1 visa or like I said, L1 visa, things will be different. Uh, so next question is Nishbal. Uh, wife is currently on OPT. Employer will be applying for H1B in April 2015. So my question is, can she travel to India to attend, to attend her brother's marriage in May 2015 and come back to USA while on OPT? and having pending H-1B application in May 2015. Um, if she's got a job, we try to remember this. Uh, we have a frequently asked question on this. I think she can. Please double check with your lawyers. There are some very odd rules on uh, the travel during OPT. Uh, and the rules can be different based upon um, whether it is your first 12 months or extended 17 months. So I think it can be done if it is the first 12 months and she's got a job. Um, I don't see any problem, but double check with your lawyers, okay? Whoever is doing the H1, make sure they are cognizant of the situation, they know what you're thinking, and they are okay with it. I think you can travel. Um, Purple Girl says, I had a priority date of May 2003 under EB3. Then I left the country for more than a year for personal reasons while my adjustment of status application was pending. When my date became current, the application was denied as abandoned. I want to come back. Can I apply for an F1 visa to pursue my master's or a B1 visa? See, once you applied for a green card, it is usually difficult to get F or B visa, but not impossible. You can certainly try. Which is preferable and less risky? I don't think I can make that rule. H1 is certainly a good way to go if you can get an H1 because that does not have the problem of the green card coming in the way of the issuance of the visa. Okay, So there are no clear-cut uh, entitlements here. And by the way, uh, you should be able to, if you do your green card in future under employment-based category, you should still be able to carry the priority date from the old case of May 2003 over to your new case, whether it's EB3 or EB2. You might even be able to revive the old green card if the job always existed. Something to discuss with your lawyers. Question from AKS341, who says, um, working on H1B, I-140 approved two weeks back. If I change my job and the new employer needs to begin green card process again, what documents do I need from the current employer? Copies are enough. Usually, if somebody comes to me and says, start my second green card, I ask for a copy of the I-140 approval, and if possible, a copy of the ETA-9089, the form application. But definitely a copy of the I-140 approval. We can get you the priority date without that, but it makes things easier. There's a possibility that I may lose my job in a few months. If I lose my job, I would file for B2. This would allow me to remain in the US legally until decision comes for the B2 petition. Yes, that is correct. It is not considered to be complete status, but it's considered to be authorized period of stay when you apply for a B2. Okay. 
Assuming it takes me a few months to find a job while waiting on the B2, new employer files the H1B, what would be the impact of having a B2 file? Okay, this can be an issue, remember this. Because pending B2 is not complete status, it's authorized period of stay. If your old H1 has expired or been revoked, and, or you've fallen out of status because you don't have a job anymore, and the only status, quote unquote status, is being authorized to stay in the United States, you cannot go from there to H1. So on the date your H1 is decided, unless the B2 has already been decided in your favor, you will be asked to go outside USA for H1 visa stamp. So the only way you will be able to get H1 within the United States is if the second H1 is applied, and on the date it is adjudicated, you already have the B2 ruling in your favor. If the B2 is denied or still pending, you will be given the H1 if it is approved, but you'll be asked to go outside USA for visa stamp. The duration of the next H1B will be three years, yes, because your I-140 is approved. The continuity of the priority date from the current employer to the next employer. If there's a gap in the H1B, and I file B2, is the priority date going to be a problem? No, no, no. Your priority date does not get affected by either your gap in the H1B or the fact that you filed the B2. So your priority date remains solid. Don't worry about that. Next question is a frequently asked question from Dr. Rafi. He's a J1 physician who is working on a waiver job. So the way it works is physicians, when they have a J-1, they get a waiver job like a Conrad 30 or a federally approved um, facility or through Veterans Administration, any one of those things. And they're working on completing that waiver job, typically three years. So the question is, when can I file 485? This comes up very frequently in the context of physicians, both when they are trying to do, when they're trying to do an EB-1 or a national interest level, or in this case, applying through his wife, the answer is you cannot file 485 until your three years of waiver are complete. Even if filed one day too early, your 485 will be rejected. Okay? So until your, your uh, waiver is complete, and I think what you mean is I-485, not I-485, or not I-145. So... Now, I'll correct that later, but that's a, that's a typo you made. You cannot file I-485 until your three years are complete. Okay. Um, by the way, this is a mark as a frequently asked question. Does anybody have a question, follow-up question, comment on this issue? If you do, not new, no new questions, anything to do with J1 physicians, press star 5, what we just discussed. If you have a question, press star 5. One question, two questions. Okay, remember guys, nothing new, three questions. I'm not going to answer any question other than J1 physicians who are doing a waiver job and want to apply for a 485. If you have raised your hand by mistake, press star five again. We'll deal with new questions later, but no new questions right now. One hand went down. I have two hands up still, okay. So let's go with, in the order that you guys called in, there's only one raised hand now. Thank you, folks. I'll, I'll get to the new questions at the end of the call. Not long now. Um, so uh, Texas, go ahead, please. You have some follow-up questions. So uh, can I apply for, uh, you know, uh, the EAD once my uh, 485 is filed? No, Doc, you cannot, because until you file 485, you can't get EAD. Sure. So if I'm planning to travel, I can't apply for advanced parole, too. I'll need to have at least some H1 for now. That is correct. Both advanced parole and EAD are tied in to the 485. If you cannot apply for 485, you cannot get the derivative applications of EAD or advanced parole approved. 
Sure. Uh, so the best time to file for 45, even if it's the day after the waiver, will be okay? That is fine. Just make sure it's not the day before. Because if it's even one day before the waiver three years are completed, they will send your application back six months down the line. Perfect. Thanks a lot. I'll, I'll make sure. You're welcome. Good luck, sir. Okay, there's one more question on this. Uh, and this one is from Marilyn. Marilyn, go ahead, please. Hello, Rajiv. Hello, sir. Uh, hi. Uh, I, you answered my question on uh, H1B to H4 transfer. Uh, so I had a follow-up question. So you said uh, uh, I can write to consulate to see if I can go for H4 stamping. But if the H4 is currently stamped and if it's valid, uh, then can I just file change of status and then can my, can my wife travel uh, on H4 visa? Well, I did not want to answer any question other than the one we discussed just now about the J1 waiver. Um, nevertheless, so that now that you have raised this question, which question number are you? So this is the question, uh, change of status from H1B to H4. Do you know the question number? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the question number is uh, number five. Number five. Give me a moment. Um, guys, don't ask me, don't interrupt the conference um, um, until I, I come to the end of the conference. I'll, do, I'll deal with this right now, but for all everybody else, please let's maintain the flow, okay? So SMP. Sorry, I, I no, no, that's okay, I understand. White card H1B visa, H1B is valid, looking for a client. So I already answered this question. What, what else did you have on this? Uh, my question was... Uh... Can she file for change of status uh, and uh, then file on, uh, once the change of status is filed, can she travel uh, while the change of status is pending? You mean, can she apply for from H1B to H4? Yes. See, right now she's out of status. Okay. Because she her H1B is approved and she doesn't have a job. If the H-1B was approved with a change of status, she is out of status. So when you're out of status, it's very unlikely that USCIS will give you H-4 within the United States. Okay. 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 So, okay. so only option is to uh, get a client on H-1B and that's only option, right? Even that, I think, is a little hinky right now because... Um, it's past 60 days from the date of approval, and it appears to me that she's out of status, and the only cure is to go outside, get an H-4 visa stamping, and come back. Okay. All right. So she can, she can go for H-4 stamping right now? Absolutely. Because if you are on H-1, uh, she does not need a pre-approval from USCIS of any petition to get H-4 visa. H-4 visa is different than H-1. For H-1, you first need a USCIS approval. H-4, you can just walk in with the H-1 approval. Okay. 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 Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Um, where were I? Where were we? So we were doing the frequently asked question on the J1. Then husband is on L1A. This is uh, Ramesh, ASW or AR. Husband is on L1A since 2008. Seven years expired 2015 or expired May 2015. The employer is now going to do with green card. I am on L2, EAD. My I-140 is approved. Good. Uh, President's executive action says, H-1 visa holder with approved I-140 can apply for 485. If it becomes a rule, am I eligible to apply for 485? I believe so. Because I don't think there is um, anything in the law so far or policy so far that says uh, only H-1 people can apply for this benefit. It appears to me to be reasonable that people who are on um, L-2 would also qualify. I don't know why somebody has a raised hand. I did not invite a question. 
Let's just wait until the end of the call, please. Okay, next question. Uh, so in my view, you should be able to qualify. Um, I don't think you need to be on HMO, but then I don't know yet. We don't have the details of the policy. We just kind of know that's what they are thinking. Now, this is also a frequently asked question. Uh, if you have your hand raised, please put it down, star five, put it down, because we're not at the end of the call yet. Um, I will only answer questions in between for frequently asked questions. Thank you. Okay, now, this is a frequently asked question. When somebody, so pay attention, if you have this situation, or you posted this question, or you have a comment on this issue, you can raise your hand once I'm done answering this question. What happens is sometimes USCIS mistakenly gives you more time than you are entitled to on your H-1. So let's say you are entitled, your six years are getting over in one year and they gave you two years by mistake or they gave you three years by mistake. Can you use that time? And the answer is that's very risky. Don't do that because USCIS has said that if they think that you're deliberately misusing uh, an error made by them, they can consider that to be a deportable offense and it's just, it can be messy, okay? So you should assume, whatever you do, you should assume that you have to go with whatever the correct date is. You can even call USCIS, make notes of the call, date, time, etc. ask them what they want you to do. Um, you know, um, luckily, uh, this is something that your lawyer should be able to resolve. Have them talk with USCIS or have them send a letter to USCIS protect yourself. Don't assume that because USCIS made an error and gave you more time, you can use it. Okay. Uh, any question about this star five? Only this, please. Question about error on the H1 giving you too much time. Okay. We have one question. Let's go to California. Uh, go ahead, please. Go ahead, California. So I'm the person who posted a question regarding the error in last H-1B extension. Yes, sir. Uh, now, uh, now that my I-140 has been approved uh, two weeks back, I understand that based on the I-140 approval, I am eligible to get another three-year of extension on my H-1B. Now that this is already there, how does the error uh, that happened in the month of Jan of this year when USCIS gave me two years of H-1B instead of giving me just one year of H-1B. What should I do now that I-140 I is approved? Should I assume that because I-140 is approved, the last three years of extension that I got on H-1 is thing that I can use and I do not need to do something? Don't assume that. Go ahead and apply for an extension. If they uh, throw your papers out and say it's too early, no problem, you try. Make sure there's an explanation letter written with it that says um, this extension is invalid. You should give a new extension all the way to three years because it, it appears to be, have been given in error. Uh, go ahead and do your job. If they throw your case out, no problem. That's good for us. I have no problem. Okay. Okay. I mean, I have spoken with uh, the with me at my, of my employer and they are saying that uh, they don't do file an extension because this they, there is still almost two years remaining on the H-1B and, and uh, uh, there is no need to file an extension. So I'm in a, you know. Get it, get it in writing. Just tell them to give it to you in writing. Oh, okay. That's as All simple right. as that because I don't want you to be held responsible for it. If your lawyer says it's okay, you can rely upon the advice of counsel. Okay. Right. And, okay. And, 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 All right. and if they do give it to you in writing, I want you to call back in and tell me. I can almost guarantee you they won't give it to you in writing. Uh, yes, I, I, I mean that I would not be given this thing in writing because uh, uh, that, that is something that I had requested them a few months back that you give me the same thing, that give me this submission in writing that I'd not need to file an extension. 
uh, and they said, no, no, I will not give you that in writing. So, yeah, so what does that so tell you? What, what, does, what does that tell you? What kind of a lawyer is, look, if somebody asks me for an opinion in writing, I'll be honest with you. I will never give an opinion in writing. It takes too long to write things out. But I'll send you a recording. I'll be happy to send you a voice recording that says, in my opinion, this is what you should do. Okay, we do it all the time. We record conversations. We send the record, recorded file to our clients. Uh, writing a formal opinion is a long process. But giving a voicemail or at least something that you can keep as a record of your lawyers advising you something, how long does that take? And I'll tell you this, if a lawyer is not willing to do that, I don't know if they are fit to practice law. You should stand by your opinions. Can't be sleazy about it. Okay? Okay, I, I, will, I will follow through on, on your advice. Uh, yes, sir. Get, get, some, what the outcome is. get something in writing or tell your employers they are facing the same trouble as you are. Because if they are employing you without authorization, they can be in trouble with USCIS too. Okay. All right. Very well. All right. Good luck. All right. Thanks. All right. We have one more raised hand on this issue. Remember, I'm only going to talk about this issue, nothing else right now. So let's see. New York, go ahead, please. New York. Yeah, uh, I have a question. Uh, in this, I'm practically on H1B and I'm. Sorry, you have a new question. I'm not going to answer that. I, I told people I'm going to answer only this question. Sorry, I won't deal with it. Let me finish my questions first. At the end of the call, I'll invite you questions. Okay, next question is from, again, from AX. AX AKST41, um, explain this data. I'm not going to get into that. There are too many issues here that I can't comment about. How are they going to deal with the pending inventory? I do not know the answer yet. Obama's immigration action is still in theory. There's nothing implemented. I do not know what they're going to do. Next question, uh, Psi1984. Holding H1B, I don't know why this is all in quotes. Um, holding H1B and I haven't traveled to US in the past. They got a project 60 day. Project. Oh, I think I just answered that question. Uh, yes, I've already answered this question. If you enter USA on H1B, even if you enter for 10 days, it is my understanding you must be paid a full salary as per the US standards for a W-2 employee, not per diem. Okay. Uh, and please don't post private links on um, conference calls. Um, we don't want any kind of a endorsement or implied endorsement of people's information. We don't know what that information is like. So I really don't care about tax laws. I don't know anything about tax laws side. I only know about immigration laws, okay? Uh, Jerica came to USA on H4, enrolled in a university, converted to F1 a few months back. Can she convert to H1 again? The answer is sure. Why can't you have multiple changes of status if you go on to go from H4 to F1 back to H1? I don't see any problem with it, okay? The only time it could be a problem, and in your case, that's not a real issue, is if somebody were just trying to maintain status by converting to F1, and they were not a good faith student. In your case, you were on H4. It's not like you, you were trying to maintain status or something, okay? Next question is also marked. Well, guys, uh, we are um, at the last question already, so we'll start new questions as soon as I'm done with this one. So this is from, Kehu, Kehu, oh, <laughs> some interesting handles here. So this is also a frequently asked question. What is the question? I'm working for an employer on H1B. 
My transfer to another employer, let's call them employer Y, gets approved. I'm working for X, Y gets approved. Can I continue working for X? The answer is yes. Under immigration law, approval of the second case does not overrule your previous H1 approval. If you choose not to join them, or join them or join them six months later, I think it's okay. I do believe so, okay? Uh, however, if there's a contract to the country, if you've signed some kind of a contract with employer B or employer Y in this case, uh, just make sure you're not violating the contract. That's a separate issue. I can't comment about that. Under immigration law, I don't see any problem for you to continue working for company A. How long? That's a very difficult question to answer. Okay. I do not know that I can set up a time limit on this. I would say commercially reasonable period of time. Technically, under the law, there is no limit to how long you can continue. But I worry that the H1 can be considered to be um, perhaps defunct if you haven't joined in six months or seven months or four months or five months. Um, USCIS can raise an objection. Does the second employer really have a job for you? Okay. So don't continue too long. What is too long? I don't have an answer for you. There is no legal uh, limit here established by law. Okay. Uh, anybody has a question only on this issue that I just discussed? We'll start new questions after this. Any question on this issue of H1 transfer? Press star five. Okay, so we are done with all the posted questions. Uh, there is one raised hand. Let's, uh, New York, go ahead, please, New York. Yeah, I have some questions on the actual transfer. Not, 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 hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, stop. Not on H1 transfer. I am only dealing with the issue of continuing to work for the old employer. Hang on. I'll come to your question. No, guys, I'm only doing follow-ups right now. Okay. No new questions. Only follow-up questions from those people who have posted. No new questions. Let's deal with the posted questions first. Do not ask me a new question. That will be to the very end. Posted questions, any follow-ups on questions that have been posted, star five, please. One. Any follow-ups on the posted questions? Okay, good. Once I finish this one call, then we'll start the new questions. Okay, your number, I don't know where it is from. Oh, two raised hands. Okay. Um, go ahead. Uh, what is your question? I don't know where you're calling from. Looks like a voice over IP. Hi. Hi, Raju. This is Saif. Um, my question is that Look, I haven't specifically researched this uh, issue. Sir, one second. I haven't specifically researched this issue, but I'm quite sure that I'm right. You cannot enter the U.S. on H-1 visa and not comply with the terms of the H-1 visa. Okay. Uh, you like to say um, uh, like uh, I should be on the uh, US payroll, not on the Indian payroll, with respect of my duration of in the uh, US. That is correct, sir. Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. Uh, like, but my employer is saying that he is a part of multinational corporate operation, so he can uh, run uh, uh, payroll in the home country. That's what he's claiming. Not the entire payroll. Uh, if I if I remember if I remember correctly, there is some exemption for benefits being run out of the country. But I am I'm not sure. I must confess that if they know something more than I do, just get something from them in writing that says uh, they are going to run your payroll and this is legal for them to do. I think you are protected. 
Okay. Like they have sent me a mail, uh, a Tony and my HR has sent me a mail saying that you are doing as per, uh, uh, I mean, we are, we are not violating any law or not, uh, we are doing as per immigration law. So that's what the only written thing I have. I, mean, I, from that I, couldn't see the I don't know the answer to your question. In my view, from what I remember, last time I looked into this issue, you have to be paid under U.S. laws. Um, you're welcome to set up a call for us and do a consultation with us. I'll have somebody look up the issue for you. We'll charge you for it. But I don't think that's true. You can also call USCIS and see if they have any information for you. Okay. Good luck. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, once again, Guys, you have your hands up. Make sure it's a follow-up on posted questions. If it is not a follow-up on a posted question, press star five and put your hand down. I'll get to you as soon as I finish the follow-ups. All right, uh, follow-ups only, please. Thank you for putting your hand down, appreciate it. All right, California, go ahead, please. Um, Raju, this is about uh, question number 12. Well, one second. Uh, Let me get there. One second. My H1, uh, I'm working on H1B. I went 40 years approved. And I wanted them to give me the approval documents and the copy of the petition for I went 40. But whatever, whatever their policy is, they have denied giving me the approval document and the original petition document. So. Uh, that's okay. That that, that, that's okay. That's okay. By any future employer that, that I must that, have, that's need okay. to have a copy of the approval, definitely. Um, that's okay. Look, uh, pretty much everything can be done without the I-140 approval. Um, if they are not giving you a copy, they are not giving you a copy. It's awfully mean spirited, but it is what it is. Uh, it really doesn't hurt them to give you a copy of the approval notice. It's uh, in my in my view, it's it's being a schmuck. That's what it is. Okay, so there's a there's a there's a Yiddish word schmuck, which just means uh, a polite form of a jackass. But you know they are what they are. Don't worry about it. Um, what you should do is two things. One, um, make sure that you discuss it with your lawyers who are going to do the H1, that you have the I-140 approval but you don't have a copy of it. Second thing you want to do is file a Freedom of Information Act request. Actually, technically Privacy Act. Request. But it's the same form. File a Freedom of Information Act slash Privacy Act request and ask USCIS to give you copies of your immigration file. You might be able to get a lot of information that way. It's a free form. It's a one-page form, easy to file. File that. Uh, okay, this, where, where would I get the information for the filing the Freedom of Information Act and my immigration file. Give me one second. Uh, I'm going to the USCIS website. I'm looking at their forms page. Um, let's see. I think it's I, uh, G639 or something, but let me double check. I'll tell you what form it is. Yes, it is G as in girl, 639. File that form. Okay, G as in girl 639. Yep. Everybody remember, you have a right to a copy of the material uh, that pertains to you. Uh, see, USCIS is not supposed to give you a copy of the employer's papers, but they often do. Okay, so go ahead and apply for it. It's a good idea. Okay, that's very helpful. Thanks a lot. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, and uh, you also said in the, I also asked in the same question that uh, essentially if there is a gap in my job, let's say, you know, lose my job, it is fine. I'll continue to get an extension of H1B based on the current I-140 approval and the priority date will also remain uh, with me. The only time, um, no, no, hang on. So, hang on, hang on, hang on. You have it half right. Um, your priority date cannot be disturbed by the old employer. Uh, even if they revoke your I-140, 
your priority date belongs to you. The only time you lose your priority date is if USCIS revokes it for fraud or misrepresentation, okay, or for some reason, very limited reasons like not approvable when filed. So your employer cannot disturb your priority date, but if they revoke your I-140, you will not be able to get H-1 extensions based upon the I-140 because that's gone. Oh, okay. If they revoke my I-140, okay, then I won't get the H-1 extension. Uh, so, so a follow-up question is: uh, Are they allowed to revoke my approved I-140 if I leave them and there is some disagreement or whatever, and they just decide to revoke it, or can do they have to have a very valid reason uh, that that they will find it difficult to revoke the I-140? They can they can revoke it with a simple letter. We hereby revoke the I-140. There's not even a need to give a reason. It's their application. They can revoke it anytime they want. I see. Okay. Okay. So the so the revocation of I-140 is pretty easy. It is their discretion. It's just that I still continue to have the priority date. Yes. Um, yes. Okay. That is correct. Cool. Okay. Okay. All right. That's healthy. Let's get on to the next call. Good luck. Thank you. There's another question from somebody else in California. Right now, we are just doing follow-ups on posted questions. I'm not doing any new questions. Um, California, go ahead, follow-up. Hi, Raju. Uh, this is Satish. Hi, Satish. So follow-up for the question number one. One, OK. Uh, yeah, I, we are hearing like uh, there is like a, if you I-140 is approved, uh, you are eligible for uh, applying for uh, EAD. Was this uh, is it under uh, rules now, or we can go ahead, or do no. you have any details on that? There are no details yet. So this is right now. It's just a twinkle in the eye of President Obama. It's not been implemented. It's not implemented, right? No, sir. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, guys. Any question on any topic? Go ahead, please. Press star five on your phone. Any question? New, old? Anything, please go ahead. Now is the time we can take up all questions. Three, four, four questions, four people with questions. Okay, we are going to go, five people. We are going to go in the order in which you called in. Whoever called in first, I'll go with them first. Okay, um, California, go ahead, please. Cal California. Um, Raju, this is the question number 16. Okay. Um, essentially, uh, I wanted to understand, you know, leave aside Obama, Obama the immigration action, etc. Uh, the the link that I posted it essentially shows the pending inventory of I four eighty five. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop you. I'm gonna stop you. I'm gonna stop you. I'm gonna stop you. I don't understand what sir, that data means. Sir, I mean, sir, sir. In that, I'm sorry. I'm gonna stop you right now. I have not looked at this data, nor do I want to bunch of reasons. There are so many ways this can go. Until I know for sure which way the government is headed, I am not a researcher. I'm not a college professor. I'm a lawyer. I only deal with practical problems. So I'm not going to get into that right now. When I have time, over the holidays, I'll have time. Uh, send me an email. When you have questions, all your questions, send them to me in an email. I would say around, I don't know what time we are closing our office. Call recording is on. Yes. Uh, so, Manji, when are we closing for uh, um, Christmas? Christmas, yes. Uh, 25th would be the first day. We are closed from 25th to what date? Uh, till 1st. Thank you. So, send me an email between 25th and 1st. I will take a look at your uh, questions. I'll have time then. Um, my email is help at immigration.com. Okay. Okay. Great. I'll okay. take a so Thank make you. a whole little list of questions. I will sit through them. I'll, I'll do my very best to answer all of them for you. Okay. All righty. Let's go on to New Jersey. From the beautiful valleys of New Jersey, 
Go ahead, please. Ramsey, Ramsey, New Jersey. Hi, Rashid. Um, my parents have come from India to US and they are staying with me on a visitor visa. Okay. Okay. And their INJ report is getting expired in 45 days. We are planning to apply for their time and report extension. Okay. Um, I just want to I just wanted to know from you. I mean, I have a couple of questions. So my first question is um, for some reason. The I-94 extension request is denied by USCIS. I mean, how many days will my parents be having a grace period for them to leave the USA? There is no grace period. There, there, there is no grace period. Let's stop right there. If you apply for an extension of the I-94 for a tourist visa holder, and let's say it gets denied today, technically they are required to leave tomorrow. Okay. But as a practical matter, if it takes them a couple of days extra to uh, arrange for travel, I think USCIS will not find fault with that, okay? There's also a provision in the books, um, more so a matter of informal policy than really any written uh, law on this, that if your I-94 needs to be extended for less than 10 days, you can take an InfoPass appointment and ask USCIS in the local office to give you a 10-day extension, okay? Now, I don't like doing extensions of tourist stay for a couple of reasons. One reason is when they come back the next time, they can't come back for at least one more year after they leave. If they come back too soon, USCIS or CBP actually can turn them back at the airport. Not a good thing. You know, your parents are traveled 18 hours in a, in a flight and at the airport they are told you can't come and go back. That's one thing. If they have been here too long, that can happen. Second thing, if they go for visa stamping again and the consulate looks at the history of their travel and if they have applied for extensions uh, too many times, they will refuse to give them a visa again. Just keep these two things in mind. Go ahead with your question. Okay. So, I mean, so you're saying that uh, if they are 94 is rejected for some reason, and if I go for a 10 day I 94 extension using an info pass appointment, then the next time when they come, CBP may not allow them to come inside. They may have some issues at the port of entry. You understood it half correctly. What I'm saying is the problem starts when you try to get an extension of the tourist visa or tourist stay. If you get it and you know, they are here for too long. Next time when they come back, they can be turned back at the airport unless they've been out for at least one year. Second thing I'm saying is if they apply for a visa in the future and the consulate says, well, you have a history of living in USA for too long, we're not going to give you a visa. They can cause a problem. Okay. That 10 day issue only covers that situation. And I'm not even sure they are doing it anymore. They used to. Uh, the 10 day situation, the 10, 10 day situation is when you applied for an extension, it has been denied. You found out about it three days later, and it's still going to take you a week, 10 days to make arrangements for them to travel. It's a good idea to go to the local USCIS office and try to get a 10-day extension. Okay. And will there be a scenario where the I-94 extension gets denied, and the 10-year multiple entry visa, USA visitor visa, also be canceled by Homeland Security, I mean, like the DHS? It they cancel the visa also? Yes, it happens all the time. If they turn somebody back at the airport, they often cancel the visa as well. I mean, not, not turning back at the airport. Like, assume that the I-94, I have applied for the extension, the extension got denied. I sent my parents back within like a couple of weeks. I sent them back. So next time, they will not come for one, one and a half year. Good. Okay? But after one and a half year, they can come back. But will this visa still be valid or they have to go back in office they can go back in like in India for a visa stamping and then come back? Will the existing visa be also be cancelled? That is not cancelled just because the uh, extension of stay has been denied. Okay. So it is not a routine part of denial of the extension of stay for the visa to be cancelled. No. The visa should still be valid. Only the I-94 extension is denied by the USCIS, but the USCIS visitor visa, which is a multiple entry, 10-year multiple entry visa, is there. That will not be transferred by the USCIS. 
Yes, sir, you understood it correct. Okay. And I am getting the first time I'm applying for a visa visa extension. So I mean, based on your expertise, do you foresee any risk or red flag? I mean, this is the first time I'm applying. This is the second visit to USA. And I'm applying for the first time extension. Last year they came and they stayed with me for four and a half months and they left. And it has been a year they came now. And now I mean I need I there is some issue over here, so we have to apply for their extension. So I mean do you based on your expertise foresee any risk or red flag? The extension of tourist stay is never guaranteed. There is no way anybody can tell you this is definitely going to work out. But if you have a good reason for it, and you should point out the fact that they have a history of coming in and leaving well within the time permitted them, I think they should be able to get it. But what I would advise you, sir, is this. If you can afford to get a lawyer, let a lawyer do it for you. Because you don't want to say the wrong thing or present your information incorrectly. Um, I think it's better to get a lawyer if you can afford one. If you cannot afford one, make sure you tell the truth, whatever the truth is, and make sure you point out the history. Okay. And can we approach your office for your for, for your for you to the Yes, you, you you can. Um, you can send me an email to help at immigration.com. I will I don't know what we charge, but I'll get back with you. Somebody from my office will get back with you, uh, or I will get back with you what the fees of these kind of cases are. And I'll send you an email of that. Okay. Definitely. Can I ask you one more last question sure. before I complete? Yes, you can. Okay. I mean, this, at the, when my parents were entering USA, at that time, the CBP officers had in fact given I-94 for 183 days. I don't know how they have given like that because they entered in July 1st, uh, July 1st, 2014. So technically, we have to give less than January, but we have given till January 1st, which will be like 183 days. I'm not sure. Uh, the reason is they probably given it for six months and you had three months with 31 days, I guess. Okay. 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 I mean, can my parents still stay till 183 days or they have to leave before 180 days? No, no, they can, they can, they can stay, they can stay all the way to the time permitted by the I-94, definitely. No, your understanding is incorrect. We have had stays given for almost one year too. So we have stays given for 30 days, like B1 visa typically 30 days. We have stays given for one week. Uh, first time I came to USA on a tourist visa, I was given only three days too. Okay. okay. All right. Good luck. Thank you so much, Rajesh. You're welcome. I'll, I'll send you an email on help. I think it's sure. Welcome. Sure. And we'll go from there. Okay. Absolutely. Good luck okay. to you. Thank you so much. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. We have four more people with questions. Let's go to California. California, go ahead, please. Hey, record 916. Hey, Rajiv. Yeah, Rajiv. Yes, sir. Um, I have a very quick question. Uh, I I was um, um, having a, a citizenship from New Zealand, but I was born in India. So when I am applying for a green card, which one they will consider the country with? I'll give you the answer. You have to promise not to get mad at me. <laughs> I'm sorry. You're stuck. Yeah, with, ahead, you're stuck with the country of birth. For for the purposes of charging you to which state you belong for a green card, it is always the state you were born in. And by state, I mean the country. So okay. you're chargeable to India. Born country? You, yeah, you are, you, because you were born in India, no matter how many citizenships you change, you are stuck with India category. Okay. The only There's exception, on no, the only exception to this rule is if you get married to somebody born in another country. So if you want to get rid of your wife and get a new one, make sure she's not born in India. <laughs> okay, I got you. Good luck to you, sir. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. 
Um, let's go on to the next one. New York. New York, go ahead, please. Yeah, hi, Rajiv. Uh, I have a question regarding H1B. Yes. Currently, I'm working with the uh, employer A on H1B and uh, currently serving a notice to it. And my employer B, who is actually my client, is uh, negotiating with my current employer and uh, uh, trying to get me transferred to their company. Now, the thing is, I, uh, I have a notice period till let's say 17 plus one. And if uh, my second employer is not able to uh, complete the process, let's say the LPA, what you should do is um, so first of all notice is an internal thing if your old employer allows you to withdraw your notice and continue working and they have not revoked your h1 you're fine okay the second thing you can do is as long as you are still on h1 you can come home get online and apply for B2 visa or B2 status, tourist status, um, and you can do it online. So it gets to USCIS within a minute. You don't have to wait for US mail or FedEx for the next day. You can do it online the same day. That way you won't go out of status. Okay, so I can apply for B2, uh, let's say I'll go three days before the, uh, if it is not applied or approved. Yeah, so and you then, can uh, you, can, uh, you can do again, it. Uh, again, the you can even do it one day before or for the last day. Okay, okay. Okay. Uh, Good luck. And again, if we say everything is approved from my second employer, I can still get back to H1. Well, that's a little tricky, and I discussed that in detail. Listen to the recording. I talked to, I spoke to this issue that if you have a B2 status still pending and you get an H1 approval, you probably have to go outside US of visa stamping. Listen to the recording, okay? Okay, okay. All right. Good luck. Okay. All right, bye-bye. Thank you. Okay, we have, uh, uh, we still have three more questions. Let's go back to uh, Campbell, California. Go ahead, please. Uh, you, uh, my question is about uh, uh, my potential marriage to someone who was born in Nepal um, but happens to be uh, a citizen of India because her parents are citizens of India. And unfortunately, they do not have any record from the time of birth regarding the birthplace and uh, date of you know, birth certificate, etc. So I do not know what kind of documentation I would need to get that would help me, uh, one, uh, prove to the USCIS that this person was born in Nepal. Our, our documents, you know, essentially, I need some advice on that. Very difficult for me to comment because there are, this is a very specific question. And I would like to spend at least 15, 20 minutes going over all the facts with her. Uh, typically, what I would want to see is a and a letter from the local municipal corporation where she was born saying that they have no record of her birth, okay? Second, I would like to get affidavits from as many people as know that she was born in Nepal uh, who were already there. Her doctor, the nurse, the neighbors, her own parents, her cousins, her uncles, her aunts, whoever was there, get affidavits from them um, and it's still not guaranteed. I would have to get know a lot more about it, but it's possible. It's possible to still get cross chargeable. Okay. So, so, it, so you do think that this is possible? I mean, if there are instances where such situations have been approved and accepted for cross chargeability by USCIS. Yes, sir. We actually had a case like this a couple of years ago where the husband was born in Nepal, but they had no evidence. We were able to prove it to the satisfaction of the government that this was not a made up case. Okay? Okay. Okay. Good luck. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, let's get to, back to Maryland. Go ahead, Maryland. Hi, uh, So I have a question regarding 
uh, going from H4 to H1B visa status. Uh, so for my wife, she has H1B approved uh, in the past, and she wants to go back to if she wants to go apply from H4 to H1B uh, without going through the uh, quota system because she already has H1B approved. What's the procedure and how long it takes? for the change of status filing and uh, uh, granting the change of status. Assuming that she is not subject to the quota and assuming you file the paperwork under premium processing, it could be as little as three weeks to six, eight, 10 weeks, something like that. So it all depends upon how many questions the government asks. File premium processing, if she's not subject to the quota, it should be a matter of a few weeks. Okay. And uh, one more question is uh, the H-4 work authorization uh, rule, which was uh, under review last uh, this year, uh, uh, for the comments uh, which are open. Uh, do we know uh, what time this will be implemented? Uh, uh, is I, there any anticipation on? I looked at the regulation, the pending regulation. It seemed to indicate by the end of December. Okay. Okay. So we can expect, so we can expect this to be implemented in from January or. I don't know the implementation, but the regulation appears to expire, or the notice appears to expire in December. So they should have something done by December. They can take more time, uh, but it has been said that end December is what we are looking at. That's the word on the street. Okay. And typically. In these cases, typically, is it immediately applied or it takes time? Um, that's up to the government. I don't see any reason for them to take time on this um, unless they need to change some forms, etc., which I don't think so. I can't think why they would need to change any forms. I think it should be fine. It should be immediate. That's what I think. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Good luck. Thanks. You're welcome. Thanks. Okay, folks. This is the last question. I will not be answering any more questions. Last question of the day, and actually there are no more questions. There are some people still on the phone, but we will just take this last question from Texas. Go ahead, Texas. Uh, uh, again, uh, this is uh, uh, Abed, uh, you know, the position on J1. Yes, sir. So, uh, you know, uh, assuming that, you know, I'll apply for, I, uh, we're hoping that I'll apply for 485, you know, once uh, my waiver is completed. Uh, do you know if I could apply for EAD right away or do I have to wait for a few months? And do you know how long will the EAD take to, uh, you know, get approved? The EAD time frame is usually within 90 days, but they have been screwing that up quite royally. So it might take a little bit longer, but the government's aim is to get it approved within 90 days. As to when you can apply for EAD, whenever you can apply for 485, you can apply for EAD along with it. Okay. Uh, the problem is, you know, uh, would you recommend me to be on H1, you know, while this process is going on? Or you think it would be okay to uh, for me to be in the, in the country and just wait for the EAD? Definitely stay on H1, Doc, because with this government, the more backup plans you have, the better off you are. Got you. Okay. I appreciate it, Alisa. Thanks a lot. You're welcome, sir. Good to talk with you. Thank you all for being here. I always okay. enjoy talking with all of you. And uh, we'll see you again in a couple of weeks. Good luck, guys. Bye-bye. Every other Thursday at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we host um, free community conference calls. Everybody is welcome to join. Some people post questions ahead of time. You can take membership in our forums. Uh, all of the details are there on our website, immigration.com. You can take membership uh, ahead of time. And, um, you know, it's instantaneous. It happens right away. And post your questions beforehand. Or you can just log in. Uh, the phone number in all are provided, 202-800-8394, 1230 Eastern Standard Time, every other Thursday. We have uh, free apps for both Apple iOS platform for your iPhones and iPads as well as for Android. Just look for immigration.com, immigration.com, the period dot, and uh, the application should show up.